What's up guys, I'm gonna do a video here talking about my journey and myself. The reason why I'm gonna do this is because we saw a thread in the community room talking from JCL, talking about why is there this myth that traders can't beat the market, that most day traders fail uh, when you're seeing so many people be successful and beat the market. And I thought about you know that, that myth that you put in your head that 90% of the traders fail and all this stuff that we always hear, they, it's it's fool's game. You, there's no way to continuously beat the market. And then, you know, I thought, well, we know that's wrong. Um, but let me just share my story and share my journey with everyone uh, because it might inspire some inspiration for those that are struggling in the business or thinking they can't do this or you need certain tools in order to get through this. And I'm going to tell you, no, that's incorrect. Um, I'm 39 years old. I'm late in the game. There's people at FIT uh, trading early 20s. Some teenagers, like I, I wish I started at those times, but also the resources you have available now today too, through charting, through educational videos, through books, like all this stuff. There's so much tools available to you that you could uh, get well ahead of the game versus the way it was back in the day. But listen, I'm going to tell you my journey, the full journey in terms of my life, because I do come from, lack of a better term, and I, I come from a poverty type situation, and here I am today in a very different circumstance. Um, so ideally, it provides a little bit of inspiration for anybody out there that's thinking, can they do this long term? Uh, parents are born and raised in Portugal. They both, uh, both families moved to Brazil, and that's where they met. They met and married in Brazil. Um, and then my sister was born in Brazil. Struggling, poverty type situation. Uh, listen, my dad grew up on a dirt road in Portugal in a little bit, in a little shack. Okay, I visited this place when I was four years old. And I'll never forget, it's one of my early childhood memories, seeing the place where he lived. Um, so we're going to circle back to that. Um, then they, so then my mom and my dad and my sister came to Canada. Uh, three families ended up living in one little semi detached. Me and my brother both born in Toronto, and then uh, moved around a lot, right? We moved around, I think I lived in about six different apartments along up until my teenage years. Uh, but throughout that, my, my dad was a cleaner. My dad used to have two cleaning jobs and one baking job. So he had three jobs. Uh, my mom was also a cleaner and she ended up opening up a bakery and that's where my dad got the third baking job. The bakery was around for a little bit, but it ended up, um, failing the business went out of business it didn't work out but throughout the entire uh, my entire upbringing I'll never forget my my mom and my dad and my dad waking up at 5 a.m every day you know having breakfast going to clean uh, coming back at home at 3 p.m going to sleep at about 3 15 3 30 waking up at 5 15 to go back to another job another cleaning job and then coming home at, at night and then when they he was a baker he used to wake up at two in the morning and do some baking and then go to that morning job like I, the struggle that i observed as a young kid was amazing like i couldn't imagine never having any time for yourself it was sleep or work sleep or work sleep or work my dad worked so much that he never made a friend in Canada. He, ne he never had a friend. His friend was my mom and our relatives. That's it. Like never had somebody they met, go out for a drink, go out for dinner, nothing like that. It was just people that were family because working so hard, working so much just to get his kids ahead. Now, the thing was, my sister's 14 years older than me. My brother's nine years older than me. My sister got married at 18. Okay, so... Think about that, how young I was. Um, and she was out of the house. Uh, my brother, nine years older, he moved out of the house. He moved out uh, very early as well. I was kind of like an only child for a big portion of my childhood. And my parents always working. So I was kind of on my own. Fend for yourself type scenario. And that's what I went through. Uh, so anyways, long story, long story short from that upbringing. Um, got into high school. And you know what it's like in high school. You want to like... You want to look good. You want to stand out with people. You want to, you know, you don't want to look like you don't have anything. So what did I do? I was working. I worked three jobs in high school. So I, I worked at the mall in like a sporting store. I worked uh, 
in a weekend job in a factory as a material handler. And he used to work before school started in a, another factory, which I would clean. I would clean it. So I'd get there at about six, six in the morning. It was like a two hour job, quick clean, bathrooms, floors before the factory would open up from the night shift to the morning shift. And I would do that. And that's how I was making some money to get through, um, hey, high school, you know, having some decent clothes, having some hats to wear, um, you know, shoes. That, that was my that was my high school experience. And then uh, high school was coming to an end and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. So I didn't come from a family that pushed education, that pushed going to university, that pushed that you had to, you know, you had to get post-secondary. It was nothing like that. So what did I do? When high school finished, uh, for six months, I worked in a factory uh, full-time as a material handler. And uh, I realized really quickly, this is not for me. This is not the environment I want to be in long-term. So what did I do? I decided to apply for college um, to be a, a police officer. So I was trying to be a cop. So I went to Police Foundations course, Seneca College, King City, here in, uh, here in Ontario. And I did the two-year course. Um, but while I was there, while I was there, I had applied for a job at the Air Canada Center uh, to be an usher for Raptors, Leafs, all this stuff, right? But when I applied for that job, they they called me. It was 9-11, they called me. And they called me in for an uh, opportunity to be a security officer instead. So that to me was like, whoa, because the usher job, I think, was paying like, 12 bucks an hour and the security job was paying like 18 bucks an hour. And I was like, wow, this is like amazing. Like to be security instead of an usher, like I just wanted my foot in the door. But because I was doing that police foundations course, they opened up that opportunity for me. So anyways, I ended up getting the job at the Air Canada Center and I had a behavior of working hard, right? So I was working three jobs in high school. I had a behavior of working hard. So I got in there and this was like the biggest, best job I ever got in my life. So I was like, they would call people like they would need security for to open this, open that. I would answer every single call. That ended up benefiting me so much because the dispatcher was like, this guy's the hardest working guy here at that time. And he's like, okay, you know what? When it comes to duties, I'm going to really hook this guy up with all the duties. So you have bench duty for the Leafs. You have bench duty for the Raptors. Um, I used to sit on the bench all the time for all those games. I'd be the security guy that's sitting there on the bench. It was the greatest job I could ever imagine. One of the guys I had met there uh, was a security officer, was working the hotel business. And he told me, hey, listen, the hotel is looking for full-time security officers. Um, I know, you, like I was graduating school. If you're looking for a full-time job, because the Air Canada thing was part-time, I'll get you a job in the hotel. Boom. I thought, okay, great. Full-time job, straight out of college. Let's do it. So I started working in the hotels, and I was a security officer, and I'm still working part-time at the Air Canada Center, which I eventually let go. But while I was working in the hotels, I was really liking the hotel industry. And, uh, you know, still, like, putting in the hours, still wanted to be a police officer, but kind of liking the hotel industry. And then uh, what ended up happening was uh, I applied for the police, police force in the Peel region, and uh, I passed the physical, I passed the written test, and I was supposed to go to an interview test, but in the interview uh, the interview uh, portion, they sent me an email and said they decided not to proceed with my application. So they didn't proceed with my application because um, I was arrested in high school. So I got into a fight in high school and I uttered some threats and um, that was it. So obviously those charges, I never got, like the charges were dropped. Like I don't have a criminal record or anything like that. But that little uh, mishap in high school, reminder, I grew up in a, not a poverty situation, but in inner city situation where you can, there's going to be some trouble. There's some trouble around those neighborhoods and, um, you know, there's cliques and there's groups and eventually like, you know, people don't, you know what high school's like. People don't get along. Some things, some things happen that shouldn't have happened. That's all a part of growing up. That's what happened to me. So I had been arrested police force decided not to uh, proceed with my application. It was devastating at the time, but it was actually probably the best thing that ever happened to me. So uh, I was in the hotel industry, I was working with security, and front office manager came to me one day. He says, you know what, I really like your customer service skills. Would you be interested in coming up and being a manager in the front office area, which would have been with the bellman, the valet, with the, you know, that part of the business, and leaving the security side, which at the time was a significant boost 
in my salary. I was making $38,000 as a security officer and I was gonna move up to about 45,000 to be a manager in this business, okay? So at the time, to me, this was huge, right? This was huge. Um, at this time, I also met my wife and my wife was a registered nurse um, and very successful, university degree, all this stuff, of, comes from a successful family. And you know, my wife was making over 60 and I was making 38. So she always says to this day, that when she hooked up with me, she invested like in her future. It's like she bought Bitcoin when she when she uh, when she hooked up. With me. It's just a little bit of a joke because I ended up being successful down the road, right? And now she's retired. Um, so, so getting that job in the manager's uh, portion put me a little bit more in the forefront, and I was able to move up in the hotel industry. So I was in the hotel industry, but while I was in the hotel industry. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling because that's how it is in hotels and facilitating courses and public speaking and doing these things. Oh, I forgot to mention big portion, a big key moment in my life. When I got this manager's job, uh, we used to have to go to these meetings with big conferences that would come in. So let's just say Best Buy is coming in for, it was Best Buy actually. The Best Buy is coming in for a huge conference because it's a convention hotel. And all the managers would be in our, like a round type table to talk about who we are in terms of in the hotel and how we're going to help uh, make their conference successful. This is the first time in my life where I realized I, I was scared of public speaking. So it was going around the table and it was coming up to my turn to talk and my heart was pounding out of my chest. Like I thought I was having, I was basically having a panic attack that I was going to freeze. So I couldn't breathe. So by the time it came to me, I buckled and I could not even speak. And I can't even remember the words that I said, but I just passed it on to the next person. And every single person came up to me after that meeting and was shocked. They were like, what just happened? Are you okay? What what happened? And for me, that was it. That ruined me. I was scared to do any public speaking from that point on. And, you know, I couldn't go to those managers meetings anymore. I used to try, you know, I would use, so it was part of my job, but I would always try to get someone else to go for me because I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. So this was a major fear, anxiety that I had in terms of public speaking. Complete fear if I had to ever do it again. So I was, my, my goal was to avoid it any possible way. That any It was called pre-convention a meeting. So any pre-convention meeting, I would try and find someone else to go for me. To the point where it became, you know, a handcuff for me. It's like, I'm never gonna like be successful in this business if I can't public speak, if I can't get up in large groups and lead and motivate. So I had to challenge, I had to challenge myself in this. So I took a course on public speaking, which would help me, you know, build the skills that I needed to, you know, be successful in that part of the business. So uh, that course was you getting up there and presenting material. I did this in uh, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, um, New Haven. No, I can't remember exactly the place. Yeah, it may have been New Haven. So. I did this course and I got up there and I was speaking in front of, you know, it was about 20 people and it was so difficult. It was so difficult and I kept on doing it. I kept on doing it. And then eventually what happened was um, I started to get a little bit comfortable with it and I would still have that same fear, that same anxiety, but I would, I would get a little bit more comfortable with it. And then uh, I ended up being good at it. I ended up being good at it. I conquered it. And then I was a facilitator for the hotel. So I would go around teaching people, um, about the brand because Coca-Cola had CEO the CEO of Coca-Cola had just taken over this hotel chain and he wanted to really identify the brand of this hotel. So I was one of the people that was going around helping teach the brand. But while I was going around doing that in different cities, there was there was a guy that had the same last name as me and Da Costa. And everywhere I would go, and he was from the Toronto area. And every city I would go to, or even in the Toronto area, different hotels. People would always ask me if I knew this guy. I'm leaving people's names out of it. Um, if I knew this guy, Da Costa. And I was like, everywhere I go, everyone always asks me if I know this person. But I don't. 
And one day I can't wait to meet wait to meet this person. Long story short, New York City in a training course, and one this other person I know tells me, Hey, guess who's here? The other Da Costa. I'm like, where is he? So they point him out, big guy, long hair, big beard. I didn't have a beard at the time. We looked nothing alike, but everyone always thought we were related. So I went up to him and I said, Hey, have you ever heard of Rick Da Costa? And he starts laughing, goes, Oh my god, are you Rick Da Costa? He had heard the same thing everywhere he had gone. Do you know Rick DaCosta? You're related to Rick DaCosta. We went out in New York City that night. We started drinking. He told me uh, he's got a girlfriend back in the Toronto area and he wants to, he was working in Denver at the time and he wants to come back to Toronto if I could hook him up in my hotel because I was director of guest services this time. I had moved up pretty well in the hotel business. I was director of guest services at a major Toronto hotel. And I said, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna hook it up when I get back. Three months later, He's here. He's working. He's working with us at this hotel. Um, six months later, he leaves. He goes to BMO Bank of Montreal. So he goes and gets a branch manager's job at BMO Bank of Montreal. Uh, he got tired of the whole hotel industry and said, you know what? I'm going to go into banking. He had a connection, went into banking. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm moving to Ottawa to work at the Westin in Ottawa as a director of rooms, uh, potential um that I'm going to be there for a long time now. And my wife, who had just recently been married, uh, would have to be traveling to see me on weekends. And I would see her on weekends, something along those lines, because she's a nurse. She's got her career. And we don't have the money to uh, not have both careers. So I'm doing this like two weeks in Ottawa. And it's like, oh, man, this is not going to work out. This is impossible. And this is the way it is in the hotel industry. You got to continue to move around in order to move up. Otherwise, you're very much stuck in your little zone of opportunities that are available to you in one city. So this the Costa guy is telling me you need to come to banking. Trust me, banking is the best place for you. You will do really well in this business. So I decided to throw my name in the hat and see what's gonna happen. Hey, I know nothing about banking. I know nothing about stocks. I know nothing about investments. I know nothing about lending, mortgages. I know nothing, okay? I have a mortgage and that's it. I have a credit card and that's it. I know nothing about banking. So anyways, um, I get the job. It's a training program to be a branch manager. Okay, it's a training program, a nine month training program to learn how to be a branch manager. So I go through the training program and I ended up at this branch um, a year later. So nine months training, three months doing some also some like shadowing of other branch managers. And a year later, here you go, you get a branch. And now I have this branch and I have a boss who is the hardest boss I ever had in my life, but the best boss I've ever had in my life. Somebody that makes you work so hard, but rewards you for the work. Somebody who works as hard himself as he pushes you to work, which is what I respected. Is don't ask me to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. That was very big for me because I had a reputation of hard work, but I hated bosses that were just delegators, right? They, they would just delegate everything, which is fine. There's certain parts that need to be delegated, but I need some people to show me that even in their role, they're present. They're putting in the time. They're there. Versus, yeah, they just tell you what to do. So this person was the greatest influence mentor I've ever had in my life. And I tell them, I tell them that to this day. So I'm in this branch and my first year in this branch, we finished number one in the Toronto area which was significant for us, uh, significant for me. So I got a huge bonus. At the time, it was more money than I had ever saved in a single, you know, a single paycheck. So I had this money and I didn't know what to do with it. So it's time to start investing. Oh, I forgot, I skipped something before. Um, I had invested previously. Uh, I put $15,000 into two stocks. It was recommended by, by my brother-in-law, no fault of his own. It's just, you know, we get recommended recommendations, they don't work. It was Yellow Pages and Superior Propane. I put 15,000 in. Uh, I think it was probably a month or two later, I had $5,000 left, so immediately lost everything. Yellow Pages was a bad investment. 
and superior propane tanked as well. So anyways, that was my first endeavor into investing. And I said, oh, no, no, investing is not for me. I'm never going to do that again. I just lose my money. So now I have this bonus from uh, my branch manager's job. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy some mutual funds. We're selling mutual funds in the branch. These mutual funds seem like they're a pretty safe thing. You know, they go up 6%. I started doing the, the, you know, the compounding interest. Okay, if I get 6% of my money, you know, by the time I'm 65, oh, this would be pretty good. So this is what I'm going to do. So first real endeavor into putting a sizable amount at the time, it was $52,000. Okay, I had $52,000. I put it into uh, some mutual funds. I bought like four of them. Two offices next to me is an investment broker. Okay, won't say the name, but he works for BMO Nesbitt Burns. Comes in every day in my office, chats with me. Hey, what are you investing in these days? I know nothing about it. Oh, I've got these mutual funds. He goes, why don't you buy some stocks? Buy a couple of stocks. And here, he gives me the stock. The stock was uh, PLI, okay, Prometic Life Sciences. Um, stock exploded. Like immediately, he told me to put in $2,000. Stock started to explode. And what did I do? Uh, I put everything into it. I sold everything I had because the stock was exploding. I said, I want to put my money in this. This thing is moving. So I put all my money into it. Boom, triple my account, quadruple my account. The account's flying. And I'm thinking like, I, you know, I was on stock charts. I was reading the uh, story on, not stock charts, stock house. I was reading the story on this company. Um, everything about the company. I was like, oh man, I leave these guys, these guys on stock house. Stock was $1 at the time. This guy's saying it's going to go to 1100 Okay, these stocks going to go to 1100 Like, I'm going to be rich. I'm doing the math on the calculator. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, by the time this gets to 1100 you know, here's what's going to happen. Here's how much money I'm going to have. And all that excitement. Um, so the stock exploded, and I was doing pretty well. It quadrupled my money. And one single day, I lost all of it. One single day, I lost all of it. I couldn't believe what had happened. There was a Seeking Alpha report on the stock. And it tanked the stock. It was a negative, uh, it was a hit piece, you know, bear article, short report on the stock and it tanked it. And I completely lost everything on that stock. And, you know, when you come from nothing to, you know, then ha having, you know, uh, you know, something and you lose it all, it was devastating. That was a devastating point in my uh, trading journey. Because it was like, oh, how am I ever going to get back to that? So what did I do? I could have just buckled and could have been, this is not for me. What I did instead was understand what the hell happened. How could this possibly happen? So I went through it with the investment broker and learned how that could happen. What did he show me? He showed me Bollinger Bands. He showed me RSI. He showed me moving averages. He showed me volume. And I was like, what the hell is this stuff on this chart? Like, it makes no sense to me. It absolutely made no sense to me. But I was fascinated by it. So what ended up happening was every day from there on, he was in my office checking it. I was in his office checking it, learning about the charts. On BMO Market Pro, on that platform, I was learning about the charts. Then it went onto YouTube and learned on YouTube. Then I started buying things with a little bit more education, a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more awareness. And then from there on, um, there was always struggles, right? There was always struggles along the way. And I had a day, another day, where I lost 50% of my uh, total holdings in a single day. It happened again, it happened a second time. The name of the stock, I can't recall, but it was a gold mining stock. And the name escapes me right now. But I lost 50% in a single day. The stock went from $14 to $7 in one shot. Um, also, it was another hit piece, right? Kind of like what Citron tries to do, right? Stock runs too hard. You know, they come out with a hit piece, the stock collapses. And it happened to me again. And then at that point, I realized, you know, you're going to have to have some discipline because it's extremely difficult to go through this go through this journey again and then I did and then built some good habits some good behaviors along the way but the main thing for me was to go through charts go through charts thousands and thousands of charts 
and read the charts. And then, of course, the good thing was that pot stocks came along in Canada, which you know really helped people build their wealth, right? It really helped people build their wealth if you knew how to trade. And fortunately, I went through all the struggles in advance before I got to that pot stock journey that I had built enough discipline and enough skills and enough knowledge to really take advantage of that run that was going to happen in Canadian uh, pot stocks. And then from there, I exploded my account, right? Exploded it um, to the point where um, I was at BMO now and my job, I had been promoted by the boss that I had told you was the best boss I ever had. I had worked so hard for him and he had worked so hard. He got promoted to be in charge of all of Canada for mortgages. So he was the head of Canada for mortgages and he took me with him. He made me a vice president of mortgages for Toronto West, which was basically Toronto, Etobicoke, Mississauga, Oakville, uh, that portion of the city. So I had a big job making well over six figures now, doing really good in the business. And it was a mobile job because I had a um, mortgage specialist that works for me. So I basically travel to see them. I would travel to see them and their, their realtors, their brokers, their clients. It was a great job. But also what that job allowed me to do was to trade because I had the ability, the free time capability and being mobile to trade. So while I was doing really good with my career, the Canadian pot stock uh, craze was going so nuts that you didn't want to miss out on those opportunities, especially as a trader, to take advantage of them. So it really had the opportunity to benefit from what I was currently doing that it gave me some time in order to make sure I was managing my stops, positioning myself correctly, understanding the ebbs and flows of the charts to make sure I really take advantage of the opportunity that's here. So what ended up happening was um, I made enough money in, in trading that if I ever thought I got to that level of my account size, that I would never have to work again. The funny thing about when you make money, guys and gals, is that you kind of never do think it's enough. You never do feel like, okay, you've made it now. The money in the account, like if you tell somebody, hey, you know, here's how much money I have in the account, and people are like, oh, you don't need to work anymore, you know, you've made it. You know, maybe you're that type of person that could do that and just like step back and just do nothing now. Um, but for me, it's like, no, I want to go more. You know, I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to go from here. I'm not thinking about my life. I'm thinking about my kid's life, their kid's life, their future. My dad grew up in a dirt road in Portugal in a little shack. Moved to Canada. I grew up in multiple apartments, moving around, living with three families in one semi-detached um, to now looking at my kids, how they're growing up, very different, just two generations apart. My dad, Dirt Road, Shaq, the sacrifices he made to come to a country where it doesn't even speak the language. Imagine that, like me moving somewhere I don't even speak the language to try and get my family ahead in the future. That's insane. So what now? I make some money and I'm going to stop and put my feet up. What kind of example would that be to my children and their future? Now I could picture what their children's future is going to look like. So the sacrifice that my parents made to come here and do something special to give their kids a better life, I got to do that now moving forward as well. So having the money hasn't changed anything about me. I'm actually, try I'm actually working harder now than I ever did before. Okay. Let me, let me circle back to where I was. And this is not scripted, right? This is just me talking. Um, so I'm in this uh, job as VP of mortgages. And there was a portion of the job that I really hated was fraud. Because, okay, one, you shouldn't be doing fraud. But two, it's like um, I built this relationship with these mortgage specialists that are supposed to be doing ethical work. And sometimes the work was not ethical. So... Security would do an investigation and then we'd be sitting in these meetings and we'd be investigating the person and asking them about the mortgage deals, the income, you know, sometimes these these things would be fraud, fraudulent. So anyways, one day I'm in here and I'm in an ACB trade, Aurora Cannabis, and I'm in this interview with these people and I know uh, ACB is running. It's going parabolic, right? It's running parabolic and I'm sitting there. So the... The, my staff member is right here, the security person's over here, and I got my laptop open. 
And yeah, it wasn't working so hard here, right? Because I'm watching the stock versus really being part of this investigation. Um, so you could already tell it was starting to tune out. So I'm in this in, in this trade in ACB and it starts running parabolic. So I know what's gonna happen here. We're gonna go, we're gonna unclimax, we're gonna sell off. So I start getting ready to put in stop loss, so like walk up and stop. And the security officer, or the security, uh, it was an officer, basically like a private investigator, uh, it says, you know, I gotta turn off the laptop. I need complete, uh, she needs complete for like focus from everybody. So I'm like, oh my God. So I close the laptop and I bring up my phone. And by the time I could, you know, log into my account and everything, it just went poof, volume climax and it dropped. And I missed out on the opportunity of about $50,000 in that scenario. So I'm, I'm thinking, wow, you know, this little interview here, because you're cheating the bank, fraud just cost me $50,000. That's where my mind was at. Okay, fine. I still had purpose. I like leading people. I like the manager. I like the, the job that I've worked, I've worked from security officer at the Air Canada Center to Vice President of Mortgages of BMO. Like I've gone throughout this entire journey. Um, I was I was voted uh, leader of the year for BMO uh, 2016. Um, it was, you know, accomplishment. So my first year in this VP Mortgages uh, job, I finished number one in Canada, okay? Solely through uh, the hard work of the team that I built. We finished number one in Canada. My boss at the time, so the guy I told you that took me along this journey, he was the head of Canada. My direct boss now is the head of like the Ontario region. So that's two levels up now. Um, I didn't have the same fond relationship with this person, um, which is fine. And, you know, very respected person and people loved him, but we didn't have the same... Uh, connection. Anyways, um, I felt the the relationship had not made me inspired to work there anymore. And I wasn't inspired to work there. And I had inspiration in stocks because I had been doing so well in stocks. So I decided to resign. And I resigned from my career at BMO, which was a shock to many. It was a big shock. And at that point, they they called me. The head of HR called me the, the following Monday and said, let's meet for coffee, whatever. And they decided to give me six months to, you know, six months. You're going to get paid for six months. Take your time off. Take a leave of absence and make sure you're doing the right thing. So I knew I was doing the right thing and I was trading. And while I was trading, um, every single day I traded, I realized Trading is for me. This is what's for me. This is what I love. This is where my heart is. This is where my passion is. And six months later, I officially resigned and I was out of the bank. Now, trading is a lonely business, right? Is a lonely business. So I went from leading people. My first, like that manager, that first manager's job in the hotel, I was 22 years old, uh, all the way to the VP job. I had just been managing people forever. So now I'm in a position where I'm sitting at home in my office alone um, in a chat room, you know, just talking with some people. That's the only social interaction that you're having it was a different environment. So what did I do one day? I decided to take out my phone and go on my personal Instagram and record a chart, which was canopy weed and what weed was about to do. So weed was about to implode. This thing was about to crash. And you know, I posted on my phone this video about weed's gonna implode. About an hour later, um, I will never forget, I was getting fitted for a suit for my sister-in-law's wedding and weed imploded, right? It crashed. And I was like, oh, there you go, right? I went on to my Instagram and I looked at my direct messages and I was like, whoa, I don't have a lot of followers on my Instagram, it's private. And I think like 200 followers, but I had like 53 messages. Generally, I'll have like two messages, one from my wife, one from my nephew, who's like my little brother. And that's it. And I said all these messages and people were asking me, how the hell did I know that was going to happen? And what do I do for a living and all this stuff? Like, how do you know this stuff? So now that we know, everybody was trading cannabis stocks at this time. 
even people that I had no idea were. So from that day on, they kept on sending me messages, kept on sending me messages. What do you think is going to happen today? So what I did was I started, I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to open up a, a business, a personal Instagram that's focused on stocks. So I did that. And a lot of people that remember me from those days called Rick's Trades. And I used to go on my phone and record um, what was going to happen that day in the pot stocks sector. So on my phone on Instagram and 300 people used to show up all the time. And then one uh, individual told me, why don't I set up a class that teaches people about charts? And so that was a great idea. Organically, I got recommended to do this. I said, okay, people want to do this. Sure, I'm going to go and do a class. People are going to come in and I'm going to teach them about charts. So a guy that was scared to do public speaking before, that knew nothing about stocks before, that this seemed like it was absolutely confusing is now sitting here years later facilitating a class and by the way once i got over the public fear i used to facilitate like 200 people every email like that was long gone um, as you can see now we've been doing these videos so now i'm facilitating this class teaching people about the charts and doing the rick's trades on instagram and the same individual who told me uh, once you start the classes says why don't you open up a chat group on slack why don't you do zoom so we started it rick's trades 35 people came in immediately. I thought it would have been more, but it was 35 people that came in and they trusted me. And then we went along with Rick's Trades and Rick's Trades ended up becoming fit. And here we are today. A guy who knew nothing about stocks, a guy that first stock he bought immediately lost 66% yellow pages, no financial education. Okay. I started late in the game. I had a full-blown career in hotel industry, not knowing anything about stocks. Nowadays, we put the pressure on everybody of, you need to know what you want to do, right? right? Coming out of high school, what do you want to do? University, what do you want to do? I changed careers four or five times already. And here I am now. I finally found what I love and what I love to do. And I'm inspiring people to do it. I beat the market significantly. I turned that $52,000 into multiple seven figures, okay? I did it. With my upbringing, with everything I went through, it was possible. I did it. And I didn't have the resources that you have today, which is videos like this. All the online education. It's all there for you now. I have no desire to ever stop this. Um, very comfortable. Family situation is great. But I'm going to be here a long time. And you got a long journey in front of you as well. There's going to be so many struggles along the way. But just like anything in any career, there's going to be struggles along the way. But it's hell of rewarding. And the rewarding, the reward potential is endless. You technically control it. We control it. I came from nothing and now I feel like something. And 10 years from now, I believe I'll be something even more. You need to think the same way. Where you are today, imagine where you're going to be 10 years from now. 10 years ago, okay, 10 years ago, I just started. Well, I was just starting. 28, 29, around there. Late in the game. And where I am 10 years later, I never thought. So I can't even imagine 10 years from now. Think about that. Instead of thinking about your next trade, and oh, how hard this is and the results. Think about where you're going to be. Think about where you were six months ago. Trading, your account, your psychology, your awareness of charts. Six months ago, think about it, to where you are today. Now think about six months from now. Twelve months from now. 
three years from now. The road is hard, but it's definitely worth it. I hope this video inspired you. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment. I laid it all out there. That's my journey. That's me. This is who I am. Hope you enjoyed it. Peace out, everybody.